at every one of those points, there is a change from quantity to quality. This is, a, this is something that Bergson, one of the main influences on the list, stressed a lot. In other words, you change the quantity of temperature, one more degree, one more degree, and for a while, nothing happens. If you are at 90 degrees temperature, or at, and you change it quantitatively one more degree, you end up with 91 degrees temperature, nothing happens. There was just a quantitative change. But if you are at 99 degrees and you add one more degree, a change in quantity now has become a change in quality because water now has become vapor. Right? This is, of course, also essential in the functioning of a steam engine. The steam engine is called a steam engine precisely because within the pistons, to be able to get that, that to be able to tap into the energy flowing from the hot boiler to the to the cold earth, you need this phase changes of water, you know, going from liquid to vapor and so on. Now these are very important because any change from quantity to quality gives rise to new qualities and is therefore morphogenetic. Changes from quantity to quality is what gives our world all its variety, all its interest. Now notice also that there are Let's, let me re reproduce this here, 100 degrees centigrade, 0 degrees centigrade. Options, even for the humblest substances, water at 0 degrees temperature can become ice or it can become snowflakes. Ice is a solid architecture that is relatively boring. It's, you can make it less boring by creating ice sculptures, you know, with a, with a chainsaw or something like that. But a, a, an ice cube by itself, you examine it under a microscope, it's just a repetition of hexagonally shaped crystals, one after the other. There's repetition, but there's no difference. And so Deleuze considers ice because it involves repetition, a repetition of crystals, but it shows you this is the kind of repetition that it is unproductive, precisely because it doesn't have difference. But when you consider snowflakes, every snowflake is different than every other snowflake. They still have the hexagonal symmetry, but some of them have big dendrites, dendritic growths at the end. Others, maintaining the same symmetry, actually close the thing with a hexagon and may even close the second string with a hexagon, having perhaps a few dendrites pointing out like that. And every snowflake is different from any other snowflake. So now we have there difference and repetition. The repetition of the hexagonal symmetry, but with an added difference. And that's the kind of morphogenesis that we're interested about. The one that includes both difference and repetition. Variety. So it is like, like, a, like, a, like, a, like a melody that jazz musicians are improvising on and are, and are changing to the point where the original melody is not anymore a kind of pattern to be followed, but the, the melody is the variation. The melody exists in all these different variations by all the different musicians, and that is what the real melody is, not the original melody you began with. So difference and repetition together produce very interesting types of morphogenesis. What is important here is that they all happen at critical points of intensity. Now those critical points of intensity occur in a variety of contexts, not only here. There is, for instance, another series which now has to do with what is called manners of regimes of flow. From, from uniform flow before a certain critical point to periodic or wavy flow to turbulent flow. That is supposed to be an R. Turbulent flow. The way in which any liquid flows depends on its speed. 
at a, a speed, of course, being an intensive property. For very small speeds, flows, a, a, a liquid flows relatively uniformly. It's kind of a boring type of flow. It doesn't change. At a certain critical point of speed, it depends on, on the viscosity of the flow, so I'm not even going to write numbers like I did over there, it begins flowing in a wavy way. It goes forward and backward, goes forward and backward, or you can even, even, can even create convection cells that go like this. At another critical point, it becomes turbulent, which now means eddies within eddies or vortices within vortices. That's another architecture, that's another form that has been born from intensive thresholds. This is another type of morphogenesis. Even in, in animals, we can find this intensive sequences. In the, in, in, we can find them in the gates or manners of moving of animals. Uh, we can, I could use myself as an example, but bipeds, we have less gates. Gates is the name for this manners of movement, that quadrupeds. So let's use a horse as our example. A horse at very small speeds, at very low, at low speeds, can walk. But at a certain critical point of speed, it has to break into a trot. And at another critical point of speed, it has to break into a gallop. You can test this by, by placing a horse on a conveyor belt that you, can, that you can manipulate the speed. And then, you know, so that the horse needs to, needs to move just to keep himself in the same place, right? So you begin the test by moving the conveyor at a very slow speed, and you can see the horse staying in the same place, walking. Then you get to the critical point, and, the, and you can see the horse immediately begin to use different muscles, and even in some cases different bones, in order to be able to now trot, just to keep up with the same speed. And then you start fooling around with the horse's head, right? Like, okay, now I'm going to put you in the turbulent mode, right? And he has to break into a gallop. Now you can check this with, with yourselves when you are out there. Just try walking faster and faster and faster. There's going to be a point at which you cannot go any faster unless you break into a run. And break into a run means not only using the muscles from your legs, you start using muscles from your back. In other words, a different configuration of your component muscles and bones begin to enter into action when you change into another regime of movement. So critical points of intensity are everywhere. It's just a matter of making a thorough catalog of them to begin finding them in all the different places. But they are also characteristic of intensive thinking. Right? Intensive thinking, therefore, to summarize, is thinking in terms of productive differences, differences that store fuel, and thinking in terms of critical thresholds the crossing of which produces a spontaneous morphogenetic event. The morphogenesis can be towards a boring form of repetition, or it can be towards a more expressive, more artistic form of repetition. <laughs>